busy day to hear me oh. waffle on for 20 to 30 oh, minutes okay. about myself but obviously you're used to that sort of thing so uh-huh. this is performance mode now this is your very <laughs> special live ellie harrison broadcast coming to you on the eve of i'll i'll look forward to it the exhibition which you have orchestrated at Collective Gallery as your contribution to New Work Scotland. So, last weekend, as I was trying to get my head around this project and exactly what it involved, um, you heard me refer to it as the most multi layered project that I'd ever been involved with, <laughs> which I know you quite liked. And <laughs> I like layers too. I like layers a lot. But I also like people and viewers of my work to be able to understand the layers and to be able to make sense of it. So I thought that I'd use the beginning of my broadcast, seeing that it's eventually, hopefully, fingers crossed, tomorrow night, going to end up in Collective Gallery. Um, I thought I'd use the beginning to explain a little bit about the process of creating our look forward to it. So that the viewers in the gallery can work out what on earth is going on. It's quite simple. It breaks down a bit like this. My good friend Oliver Braid was selected for the prestigious New Work Scotland programme earlier in the year. Um, this is a, in Oliver's words, in Oliver's words, a, a a show of exciting practitioners operating in Scotland. Anyway, we were all very excited that Oliver got selected. Um, And rather than seize this opportunity to exhibit his own work in the gallery, he decided, perhaps as an act of generosity, or perhaps for more sordid reasons, you all have to decide that, he decided to offer the exhibition as an opportunity to the group of artists who had been rejected from New World Scotland um, the first time around. So he decided to reopen applications to create a new opportunity for these group of rejects. And then to go, <laughs> it's all right using the word rejects. I'll come on to that later. And then to get together a group of people who are experts in positive psychology and other um, things to do with the science of happiness to select a smaller group of artists who would then become part of our look forward to it. Did I make that sound clear? I hope so. <laughs> sort of clear. Yeah, I thought it was just, sorry, I didn't know if I should interject. <laughs> That's all right. Perfect. Anyway, I am one of those rejects, as I have so affectionately been referring to them. The next phase of the project was Oliver issued all five of us with these chapters from his essay which he wanted us to read and respond to. Mine is called The Impact of Positive Thinking and Productivity. And it has been here beautifully, thoughtfully annotated by the very wise woman, Dr. Anna McLaughlin. (laughs) And I have read this essay. Yes, I have read it. And you may or may not detect that some of the themes and ideas that run through this essay um, have influence subliminally or not the content of this broadcast but also the content of the wider exhibit that i'm showing in collective gallery which is called the end product so first of all i want to reflect a little bit more on this selection process on the group of rejects who have been given a second chance opportunity myself rachel barron katie mccain joanna wakowski and jane stephen wright Although, as I said, I think reject is a slightly unfair term to use. The rejects, the real rejects, and the ones that I'm worried about are the ones who applied the first time around and the second time around and were rejected both times. These are the real unheard voices in this process. And I think that this needs to be another project for you, Oliver, to make sure that they get some reward for um, the perseverance of applying to us. Anyway, the five of us, the lucky artists on display, and I'll look forward to it, come under this strange category um, 
which I now term in the best of the rest. Okay, this idea of the best of the rest is something that I've long been familiar with. And I remember when Oliver first told me about the concept for the show, for oh, I'll look forward to it, I said to him, oh, it's like a plate tournament. You're organising a plate tournament. So I'm now going to explain in a little bit more detail what I mean by that. When I was a little girl, or, or little boy, depending on... <laughs> What you make of this photograph when I was aged about eight. I used to play short tennis. Now, short tennis is like a miniature version of tennis, but with little plastic rackets and smaller nets. Anyway, um, oh, somebody's trying to instant message me. That's really annoying. <laughs> Let me oh, go. Oh, and me too, at the same time. Let me carry on. Uh, so... I entered a big tournament in um, 1987, and I remember it clearly because I was very excited about it, and I, 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 I trained hard, and I went along, and I was knocked out in the first round, which was hugely disappointing, but then I discovered that there was this whole parallel tournament running on the exact same day and it was a tournament specially for people like myself who'd been knocked out in the first round and it was called the plate tournament so I had been given the second chance which of course I leapt at I leapt at and I worked my hardest and I battled through all of the rounds and I eventually won the plate tournament this is a little picture of me at the award ceremony being, um, actually it wasn't a plate that I won, it was a t-shirt of a small boy <laughs> playing short tennis because they gave me the boy <laughs> version because they actually thought I was a boy. <laughs> anyway, the same analogy of the best of the rest can, can be seen running throughout my life and it carries on to the point when I um, was applying to university to try and do my fine art degree. I always knew that I wanted to be an artist, embarrassing as it seems, <laughs> whatever the hell that might mean as well. And anyway, I looked around lots of different fine art courses outside of London, and my favourite one by a long shot was Nottingham Trent University. I just fell in love with that place for some reason. It just had such an amazing atmosphere around it. Um, so I applied for it. And I went to the interview, and obviously I didn't do that well, because I didn't get a place. Which, again, I was totally devastated about, and I thought that it was slightly unfair as well. So, I, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was unfair. I thought I deserved a place. So, for the whole of the summer before the university started, I started a little campaign of ringing them and writing them letters, and trying to get myself um, a place on the course. And then in the first week of term, I had this uh, call on my pager, because there weren't mobile phones in 1998. Well, there were, but I didn't have one. And on my pager, it said, there's a place become available and that I could start straight away. So, I went to Nottingham Trent, and I worked really, really hard. I've been given a chance to prove myself, and I was determined to get my first class degree, which I did get my first class degree. And here is my certificate. That is my full name, Eleanor Mary Gwyneth Harrison, which I don't use <laughs> Displayed in my national record of achievement. Now, these national record of achievements, me and my sister were joking about this the other day because these were issued, I think, to every single secondary school student in the whole of the UK in the 1990s. I reckon it was John Major that was responsible for achieving these beasts. Anyway, um, the idea was that these would help us to amount our achievements and that we could carry them with them for the rest of our lives um, and hold on to it and to show how, people, how great we are. Anyway, me and my sister think that it's probably only us. We're probably the only two people in the whole of the country that still um, maintain and update our national record of achievements. She's 34 and she has just proudly presented her PhD certificate on the front page there, so bless her. If there's anybody out there listening who is still a mad advocate of the National Record of Achievement, please do get in touch because I'm trying to do a small survey about how successful they were as a policy. Anyway, this best <laughs> of the rest category is something that I've always found myself falling into. And I think that it must be something to do with that continual feeling that either you're not quite good enough 
you're not the best, or that you've been offered this second chance to prove yourself, which makes it such a huge motivator. It makes you work even harder and to strive for success. <laughs> This motivation should probably not best be described as positive thinking, actually, as the essay which Oliver wrote refers to. Because you're not motivated by this idea of like a goal of, or a dream of success in the future. You're motivated more by a fear of failure or a fear <laughs> of being proved <laughs> that actually you're not very good in the first place. Um, so... Needless to say, I seized the opportunity to be part of our Look Forward to It at Collective Gallery. Um, and my project for the gallery, which is called The End Product, plays on this opportunism, um, which I'm obviously a, a keen, which I obviously display a lot. It hands up this opportunism to the extent that th I'm using my space in the gallery as a shameless promotional display to sell my new DVD book set <coughs> for live broadcasts. And I took the advice of Camille, Camille Lewazek, who is the exhibition's designer, who all of us have been working with, just to use the opportunity to morph Oliver's curatorial um, concept, just to do something that I wanted to do anyway, which is what I've ended up doing. I wanted to make the fourth and final broadcast to complete the set for my DVD box set. I knew I wanted to do that. And I kind of knew, yeah, it was a year ago, I'm going to tell the history of the broadcast now, that I was first invited by Sally O'Reilly um, to do my first live transmission into the Whitechapel Gallery. And you can actually watch me uh, stumble, rather embarrassingly stumbling through this broadcast on the DVD box set, should you, should you purchase it. Um, or watch it in the gallery for free, I might add. <laughs> But uh, I got really good feedback from this, which was a shock, because um, it was such a surreal experience being broadcast into the auditorium in London. Anyway, I've decided to use a bit of this, rather cheekily use a bit of this feedback from a text message that Sally sent me. On the front cover of the DVD is the selling point. She texted me straight after and said, it was fantastic, doll. You're a natural performer. More! More! So <laughs> I think that reflecting on this, it's amazing how a compliment or this positive feedback can um, change the course of how your work develops. Because after I got this positive feedback, not just from Sally, but from other people at the Whitechapel, I decided to do more broadcasts throughout the year. So there followed the, the UK weather report in April and the personal political broadcast. Um, in May. But this final broadcast, which I've been longing to do ever since May, you could say, I had in my <laughs> I wanted to do I wanted to do a fourth one because I don't like odd numbers for some reason. But also I wanted to tie together some of the themes that have been reoccurring in earlier ones and to make this a more personal broadcast. Especially from one friend to another friend. Uh, it acts uh, as a sort of review, as what, a review of what's been in my eyes this completely manic year of work. So I saw this opportunity to reflect on the successes and the failures of this year, of 2011, but also to explore the, the relative subjectivity of these terms, success and failure. And also to look at the meaning of the things that I've achieved over the course of 2011, if indeed there is any meaning in these things, and to question whether any of these achievements have indeed made me happy. So, going back to Oliver's essay, the, the quote oh. that I have selected as being most significant um, is this one which talks about, um, and this is reproduced in the handout for the exhibition, I hope, and it talks about um, goal-orientated behaviour, leaving no room for emotional states which do not harmoniously aid smooth progression towards that goal. To me, this quote really jumps out because it means that when you're in work, work, work mode, you seem to neglect other aspects of your life primarily 
the play, play, play or the fun, fun, fun aspects of your life because they're not seen as being productive. So this is where I want to apologise for the last minuteness of this broadcast because it is exceptionally uh, cruel of me to only be doing this the night before the exhibition. But I might add that this is one of the downsides of collaborating, which I'm sure you're aware of, is that you relinquish control to your collaborators. So uh, you don't have this control over the outcomes you're going to get, when you're going to get them, and what you're going to get. But the short notice of this broadcast, the night before, at the last minute <laughs> this, um, of what's happening right now, is representative of the way that I found myself or been forced to work this year. Because I've been completely on the fly all the time, from one project to the next, with no rest in between. And this has been a result of committing to me too much. And as you so beautifully put it, and I love this, payback for prior desperation. <laughs> this is payback for prior desperation. So this year, I've gone from doing trajectories, which was in January, my web-based project, to Brief History of Privatisation, which was my solo show in London, quickly followed by Getting Ready to be Artist in Residence at Two Degrees in June, for which I did two projects, a work of for the self-employed. Straight after that, I thought I'd have a bit of time off, but at the conclusion of the Artist Lottery Syndicate <laughs> party, then I had the Edinburgh Art Festival, which took a lot more work than I'd been anticipating. Then there was Vault, which I constructed a whole new project called Fair Grain. Then shortly after that, there was the Converse Days Emerging Artist Award in London, where I had to produce new work, followed by Artist in Residence at Wonderbar Festival, in Newcastle, which included the solo exhibition Market Forces, which is ongoing at Vain now, which leads me up to the present. And as it turned out, after getting back from London and then Newcastle, I only had one week to get ready for <laughs> the show at Collective to produce the final uh, product or the end product, as it, I keep calling it the final product, it's called the end product, as it should say in your handout. So this has been a year of complete self-exploitation, self-exploitation to the max, which I know is not healthy, and I know it's got to stop. So this is why I've orchestrated my project for Collective, the final, pro the end product, <laughs> as a conclusion of sorts. Okay. And this is my extra layers that we're adding to the layers that Oliver has already orchestrated as part of the show. So my end product is about as much of a predetermined goal as you can get, to the extent that this broadcast is already, this broadcast that's happening now, has already been packaged up, ready to sell as part of this Trinity <laughs> box set, even before it you it even exists. All I need to do tomorrow, before the exhibition, is to edit it, put it onto the DVD, and then fill in the little blanks here with screenshots. Mm. So I really effing well hope it's recorded. I couldn't swear there because I've put a PG certificate on back and I can't change that. So, um... The end, the end product is my way of saying I can't go on like this. I need to redress the life-work balance. But the positive side of this year is that in terms of productivity, this work, work, work attitude that I've uh, approached 2011 in has meant that I have achieved a huge amount. It all started going back to Art Monthly in May. Do you all remember this one? When I, f I, I was lucky enough to get my own two-page uh, artist profile published in the magazine, and this was really, I'm still happy about this. This is something that, I'm, that you know, this, this has actually made me happy because it's finally kind of art world uh, establishment recognition, I suppose, for all the hard work that I've been put in. Um, that was followed by this article in RMT News, which I'm just as proud of, actually. This is an interview, a two-page spread about my role as the founder of the Bring Back British Rail campaign. Nothing to do with art at all. So I'm very excited about that. Um, 
And then finally, in October, they was getting shortlisted for the art prize, the Converse Days Confused art prize. So not only was this more art world establishment um, recognition from the likes of Kirsty Ogg and Sadie Coles, but it was also cool. I've never been cool before. I've never been cool before. It was so exciting. But all this success, if you want to call it success, was at the expense of being isolated and being alone. Apart from you, other <laughs> You know what I mean. And at this point, I think about my friend Isabel, I'm like, who you met in Berlin, my friend Isabel Creek, who's a very successful artist in my eyes, a very successful artist. She's several years older than me, and I've always seen her as a bit of a career mentor. And we talk about work, but more more than work, we talk about the trials and tribulations of our love lives. And I can remember her saying in one of these many protracted discussions um, that, I remember this very clearly, that her career only really took off when she became single. And this idea, uh, and that it was kind of the, 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 the fact that she was single um, that had enabled her to sufficiently focus on career, I suppose, and to make it make, to to become a success. But this idea, like, completely filled me with fear that these two things, being single and being successful artists, go hand in hand. Because unlike some people who will remain nameless. I do believe that there is another half out there, a person who I can share my life with, who can make help make things easy and less isolated. <laughs> You're so funny. I was um, so I started to wonder anyway, throughout 2011. Maybe it's been the main thing that I've been wondering about. What is the point in all of this? If if this of the what's the point in all of this success? If I have to go everywhere on my own. And I've got no one to share it with, except for, of course, my mum and dad, who will be getting a copy of Ellie Harrison broadcasts for Christmas. You too can have. Oh, what about me? You too can have this in time for Christmas. Just complete a mail order form. Um, but I began to think about instrumentalising my own success as a way of attracting potential partners. Because I thought that if I could attract potential partners, it might help me to redress my life work balance. Because if you're on your own, you just tend to fill all the time with work. The two things are kind of, it's kind of like a vicious circle. So I decided to experiment, and I know you like experiments, with dropping in a few subtle hints about my marital status in interviews. <laughs> And I thought, what better place to start than in Dazed and Confused magazine in October. So, this is my interview in Dazed. A uh, photographer came to my studio and took these very trendy shots. What, this is one, and I've used the other one on the cover of my box set to make it that also look really cool. Anyway, Dazed asked me, um, can you introduce the idea, the collaborative nature of your work, and to which I replied, <laughs> it's, collaboration is very important to me, this is very highly edited by the way, collaboration is, is very important to me, um, it's essential way to counteract the atomization of advanced capitalist societies, of creating communities. The desire to connect with like-minded individuals comes a lot from my own experience of being a single self-employed artist and therefore spending a lot of time on my own. So anyway, I just thought, put that in print and the office will come flooding in. <laughs> Look, I'm flooding in. I just sat by my computer and waited for the propositions to arrive, but alas, they didn't. Anyway, I retold this story to the very wise Dr. Anna McLaughlin, the annotator of my essay, who is also now a good pal. It was her feedback that perhaps this was slightly too desperate or slightly too upfront approach. She advised that it's not actually that wise to define oneself as single because, and I quote, it's easier to get a job when you're already employed because you look more employable. 
So maybe my tactic wasn't all that wise. And apparently her other thing was, the suggestion was that there's things that only single people say, which kind of act as a code, a way of dropping hints about their availability. One of them is to refer to their flatmate, um, which is how I have been referring to you for, for as long as we've barely lived together. So I decided that in 2012 I'm going to refer to you as my partner to see whether this kind of thing come up come across as any more available, or any more employable, rather. So, I really hope this has been recording, but I'm about to conclude this rambling broadcast. And I thought the best way to conclude it would be to refer back to your marvellous essay, The Impact of Positive uh, Thinking and Productivity. Um, and to some of the good advice, which is actually in this uh, essay, which I aim to take on board next year when addressing the, the life-work balance. Um, I decided that once I've completed the end product, finished off my DVD box set, um, I'm going to give up on my obsession with productivity, okay? Because I need to begin to allow time for these emotional states which do not simply harmoniously aid the smooth progression towards my career-oriented goals, um, I'm going to use the show at Collective as a big full stop, a conclusion to 2011. The end product, which includes this broadcast, the DVD box set, the mail order promotion, is the final goal. <laughs> the final goal okay <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to feel on Saturday morning when it's all over fact, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to feel when it's finished and the broadcast is complete and compiled onto the DVD it's packaged up and it's sitting in the gallery right. I think it's going to be a relief because today has been very stressful and it's been stressful for you as well so. <laughs> And probably, as usual, it will be a massive anticlimax. Oh, yeah. But at the moment, I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> That's it, Oliver. <laughs> Please tell me. Should I say goodbye? Bye. Good luck, my love.